My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to The Crow's Perch, where I delve into terrible tales of tabletop gaming tragedy. And today, I have quite a few stories to tell, so let's get started. In our first story, we traverse the depths of the cyberpunk dystopia of Night City, in a cyberpunk red game that gets blown off the rails. So, without further ado, let's jack into the mainframe as we gather up a murder and dive right into this story. For a bit of context, this isn't so much a horror story in that no one is really upset slash bothered by the turn of events, but rather that the entire premise of the campaign has changed due to rampant murder hoboism. A bit more of context. This campaign takes place in Cyberpunk Red, a bit of a departure from the usual fantasy setting you see in this subreddit, and takes place primarily in Pacifica. Note that at this time, Pacifica is basically the entertainment district, and in pretty good shape, despite the nuke. The main cast of this story are Storm, the exotic fixer, Black Reaper, the over-the-top solo, Rinku, the chaotic Russian nomad, Longshot, the dad of the group, and Sniper slash Solo. And... Danny DeVito. I started blasting. Bang, bang. The poser slash genetic experiment solo. It's a long story. Our story begins when the party, already a few gigs under their belt, have to help save Rinku's clan leader from an attack by a King Tao hit squad, who were sent to retrieve some sort of item he had stolen from them. It was a brutal fight that ended with Rinku's hand getting blown off by a shotgun blast, but the party eventually won and took off with the clan leader in tow, fleeing the city in their armored van. Things were going fairly well for them, even managing to outdrive the goons that come after them. But they end up with a bit of a hitch once they make it to the border. Night City border guards scan every vehicle before it enters or leaves the city, the party being no exception. And when their vehicle is scanned, the guard in charge informs them that they're carrying a wanted fugitive, they rather bluntly offer them passage for a $600 bribe, which is a bit expensive, but not overly so, and this is where everything goes off the rails. Rather than pay, Danny and Rinku, who was driving the van from the back via neural interface, grab the guard and pull him into the van, Rinku using his vampire implants to inject him with a neurotoxin, that paralyzes them. The guard fails the save, and winds up completely defenseless. At this point the other guards notice the commotion, and start firing at the crew, and Reaper shoots out his grapple hand, to press the button to open the gate, and they flee. At this point I assume they would hold the guard for ransom. Uh, no. Instead they decide to torture him for information that he didn't have and then executing him, with Danny eating his corpse. Genetic experiment. I was pretty shocked at this point, but asking out of character, everyone was fine with this turn of events. Flash forward a few sessions later, they need to get back into the city, but they're wanted fugitives at this point, so they need to find another way. Cue an epic scene where Rinku drives through the old minefield, and using a natural land formation to try and ramp over the wall of Night City, and failing the last roll by one point. They end up crashing and flying through the air like a pinwheel, before crashing into the street and an apartment building. Danny dies, and everyone gets pretty hurt. The cops end up showing up, and they have a huge firefight, where once again, they take the last guy and torture him. It's at this point that I inform the players that they have become the villains of this story, and now I'm running a campaign where they're essentially a terrorist group. Not really a horror story per se, but it completely deleted my intended story, since it involved them overturning corrupt Biotechnica's leadership and being hailed as hero edge runners. What do you guys think? I'd first like to ask, what do you think? Do you think this GM should have stopped all this before it blew up in his face? Or was it blowing up part of the fun? 
Cyberpunk Red's gotten kind of a resurgence with the success of the show Cyberpunk Edgerunners and the sudden success of the Cyberpunk 2077 video game after its spotty launch. I bring this up because those are two very different types of media that will instill two very different mindsets into players who are going to show up to your game. If they came from the video game and remember just mowing down gangs and police and droves, they're probably going to do the same thing in the tabletop game. And if they came from the show, they're either going to immediately start crying or demand that you give them a robot anime waifu to aid the party. At the end of the day, remember that as a GM, you're also playing the game and your fun is just as important as your players. With that being said, if you're cool with your party gunning down everyone in sight, then yes, this campaign went well. But if you aren't, then this is probably something you should bring up, so that everyone's on the same page about the kind of experience you're looking to have with this campaign. Whichever the case, I think it's cool that you let them have this level of freedom with the game, and that you are willing to accommodate their ridiculous playstyle. But the game master in this next story is far less permissive. So let's keep the murder going and dive right into it. Several years ago, one of my friends wanted to take his first stab at DMing. He got our usual crew of people who play in either my game or my brother's game, as we both DM. So we all knew each other very well, and all knew the fundamentals of how D&D should go. New DM friend, we'll call him David, says he wants to incorporate some homebrew rules, but only would if we all agreed to do it. This included minor tweaks like health potions are a bonus action for yourself, but an action to apply to someone else. Two, unarmed strikes can be used as a bonus action to weapon fighting attack, rather than just light weapons, and some other small tweaks. None of the other players, myself included, have any complaints. So now we get into character creation. David tells us he's going to be splitting our group into two campaigns. There are eight players. So two groups of four meeting bi-weekly. The gimmick being one group is the heroes, one group the villains. Again, we're all on board with this, as it sounds like it built to a very cool finale. My brother and I ended up in different groups. He'd be part of the ragtag adventuring party and I'd be part of the King's Army Death Squadron TM. This is where problems started to come in. David told us to pick a racing class, then come up with backstories, and we'll roll stats at some point together. So I see you roll them, so I don't think you guys cheated. Which is fair, because we have some flubbers in previous games who were like, yeah, I totally just rolled only 18s, man. <laughs> so we come up with our backstories. And my guy was the typical, I'm a rough and rugged soldier who's in some hard training and loves a good fight. Standard easy character for a first time DM. After submitting my backstory to David, I get a message from him a few hours later that just says, Strength 14, Dexterity 12, Constitution 15, Intelligence 9, Wisdom 9, Charisma 10. I replied with, What are those? And David says, Your stats? And naturally, I'm like, Huh? Because he said we'd be rolling them together later. So, I start asking him about them, and his response was along the lines of, Well, in your backstory, you said you'd only received some training, and you never included that you went to school. So that's why your mental stats are so low, and your strength is only 14. You did say you lived rugged, so your con is a little high. To which my response was, Dude, I put K had only received some training because we're starting at level 1. Can't really say I've slain gods and am the strongest to have ever lived at level 1. Also, you said we'd roll stats together. David. E yeah, uh, I lied. I'm just choosing your guys' stats. So, as all the other players started turning in their backstories, I started receiving messages from them, as I'm the group's usual DM, all along the lines of, Hey, is he serious with this stat thing? I'm gonna quit if it's gonna be this controlling, 
Bruh, he made my intelligence 4 because I said my name was Grub. So after some back and forth with David and the party, several of us decided to quit, rather than participate. Myself included, leaving only 4 of the original 8 players. My brother decided to stay in the game, so from here on out is what I've heard from him. Brother. Yeah. Anytime Grub wants to do something, David has been making them roll an idea check. Basically, if Grub's player goes, I'd like to go over to the barkeep and get a drink, he has to roll a DC 15 intelligence check or fail to have the idea to do so and suffer 1d8 of brain hemorrhage, as you're too stupid to think. Yeah. Didn't get more than 25% through the first session. The dungeon master has complete control over every single non-player character in the game. Why then would you also want to control the player characters? If you're so concerned that your players are going to cheat, to the extent that you can't even trust them to make their character in the first place, then why are you playing with them? I get that they're new to running a game, but this DM sounds like such a control freak. Is cheating in D&D bad? Definitely. It hurts trust between your players and DM, and even if you think you're getting away with it, someone in the table definitely noticed, even if they don't say anything. But trying to counter cheating by removing a player's agency with their character? Well, if they weren't going to cheat before, they might now out of sheer spite. But somehow, even this DM comes nowhere close to the DM in our next story, who runs a game that is so bad, it ruins D&D for a player for an entire decade. So without further ado, let's dive into it. Content warning for mentions of sexual violence. Couple friends wanted to know this, so I'm making a thread to link to. Sorry that this isn't a fun story. Back in high school, they tried starting a D&D club when I was a freshman. Being an eternal, awkward dork, it sounded like the best shot at having an after-school activity. I was pretty excited to try since I never played before, then not since. Sadly important. My older sister was dealing with a traumatic event with an ex that was the hot gossip of our town at the time. I had been avoiding the topic consciously, because we're both close, and the way other people poke and prod for details makes me want to puke. Anyway, I joined the first after school meeting where we made characters quickly and hopped into session one after like 30 minutes. The DM was an older guy they brought in to teach a basic game. He started off with quick backstories for the others, on why they all ended up at the same pub. Then he got to me, and started explaining that my character has been having recurring nightmares, and started describing my sister's real f***ing attack in detail. I wish I had called him out sooner, but I let him finish, and I still regret it. After that, I stopped, and asked him what the fuck. I remember him looking me in the eyes and saying, If you want this roleplay to be good, you need to be emotionally invested. I left not long after, despite the others getting pissed since they wanted to start. Didn't even consider trying D&D again until a few months ago. And I'm still a little gun-shy on commitment. So yeah, any new DMs out there need this advice. Don't fucking do this, please. I second this. The topic of sexual violence itself is incredibly delicate, to the point to where I would never recommend any DM attempting a plotline that includes it, especially not in a game that is a power fantasy, like Dungeons & Dragons. Now there are some games where sensitive topics like this can be played out, and even some tabletop RPGs like Cult Divinity Lost have modules that are designed to do so. But unless you want to lose a few of your teeth, this requires the consent of every player involved, especially if someone at your table is personally a victim to this kind of violence. And this player did not flocking consent to this DM using her trauma as edgy bait to make everyone think he's cool and serious and makes games about dark, mature topics. This whole DM needs to be thrown in the trash. And with that, thank you for listening to today's stories.
And if you enjoyed today's stories and would like to see more of them, then please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel. And if you made it this far, why not leave a comment? Can't think of a comment? Then leave the comment, bad DM alert, so I know you made it to the end of today's video. A special thanks to the Crow's Perch patrons, like our Counts of Quills, Raven, Aaron Kados, Kirito Kazuto, Critical Kunik, Evix, King Drazil, Christian Pip, Cosmosis, Rikus, Vincent, Haley Thompson, Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. Or you could pledge $5 and join our Barons of Beaks, like Kieran Slater, Running Bear 2525, Ginger Ninja, Haley McAuliffe, Captain Rell, Kumori Fior, Shane Benjamin, Jean Kid Nebula, Liminal Ark, Brittany Mars, Rimgrim, Raytheon the Nerd, Sarah Warren, Spectre Spark, Oz Torok, Ghost Legan, Mr. Hypocritical, Jesse Jodel, Kunto Sweezel, Tech Blog, Corristor, Cardis Spawn, Jester King, Lord Rend, Wormy, Den of the Drake, McEatley, and Onya. But there are rare few who would join the Dukes of Feathers, like Repetitive Debug, Elf, Craycard, Hexblading, Kive Mind, The School Bus, Mirage Vaxis, Quinn, Jared Sewer, Blues Otters, Jared Semlin, Doc Salty 96, Matthew Mulqueeny, and Acroth. And with all of that out of the way, I'll see you next time. As the Crow Flies.